name is uh, Dr. Alfred Karagu. I am uh, the CEO of the National Cancer Institute. And uh, I will uh, be taking or I will be moderating throughout uh, today's session. And um, I'm happy to note that uh, we have uh, more than uh, you know 70 of us who have joined in. And we look forward to a very engaging conversation around uh, breast cancer and its prevention and how we understand it from the primary healthcare setting. We have a, a panel of very uh, eminent speakers that will be taking us through various sessions. So I believe that uh, by the end of this uh, two hour session or thereabouts, we'll have gained quite a bit of knowledge around uh, breast cancer. Uh, so we'll maybe just uh, go through some, uh, very, very quickly go through um, some ground rules. Uh, essentially, I think uh, I would I would uh, request that we all stay muted unless we you know we, we are making a presentation, and then uh, we need to make use of the chat box uh, below the screen so that if you have any questions, because at the end of the day at the end of the session we'll have some Q and A uh, session, so we can use that time uh, to look through the questions raised in the chat box, and uh, for sure we'll be able to address uh, any emerging questions. Uh, we want to thank uh, the Kenya Network of Cancer Organizations in collaboration with uh, uh, Novartis uh, Pharmaceuticals, who have made uh, uh, possible for this um, webinar to happen. And uh, I, before I, I get straight into the business of the day, uh, I believe uh, we have a representative from uh, Novartis, uh, Dr. Mwiti Makadimo, maybe he could uh, just say one word before we proceed. Dr. Muti, if you are there, please admit yourself and uh, say hello to us. I, I'm not sure if Dr. Muti is there, but I, I know we uh, also have uh, uh, Kemri on board who are also supporting us uh, on this webinar. And I know one of the speakers who will be uh, speaking to us uh, comes from Cambridge, so we, uh, we will also get to hear from them. Um, the other thing that you also, the other announcement that we need to make is that um, through the support of uh, the Kenya Network of Cancer Organizations, we will be able to refund some um, airtime. Uh, for those of us who have uh, logged in, uh, so anyone who uh, seeks to, who would want to have their some some air, airtime refunded to them, kindly um, you can you can register through the chat box. Uh, kindly make sure that you provide your name, your email address, and your phone number. And uh, for those who may not want to uh, uh, put their names or their details on the chat box. You can actually send your details through uh, uh, through the Kencos uh, telephone number, which is 0799-400-875. Uh, I will say that again, uh, the number that you can um, send your details, that is your full name, your email, and your phone number for purposes of uh, 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 some sort of an airtime refund or uh, reimbursement is 0799 Four zero zero eight seven five. Alternatively, you can just ind indicate your details on the chat box. So we are happy that uh, we, you have all been able to join us, and without uh, you know uh, wasting too much time, we'd want to welcome our first speaker, who will be taking us through uh, the background and burden of breast cancer. Uh, I would believe that we are all aware that October globally is marked as a Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, as you realize from without uh, preempting uh, the presentation that are coming up, breast cancer is one of our biggest issues in terms of cancer. So it's only fair for us to be able to, and, uh, you know, for all of us to be able to know much more about breast cancer. So our first speaker is uh, Mrs. Ann Coril. Uh, Ann Coril. Uh, works at Kemri, where she uh, heads the cancer registry at Kemri, and she's the right person to be able to give us uh, background in terms of the figures and statistics around breast cancer. So, Anne Coril, please uh, uh, go ahead and uh, make your presentation. 
thank you, thank you Dr. Karagu for the introduction. Um, I will ask Dr. Bor to share my presentation. Good evening, everybody. Um, glad to see each of you. I, I see more than 90 people um, connected virtually. So this is really impressive. So thank you all for finding time to join this meeting. I, I will wait for Dr. Dr. Bor, would you like to share my presentation or should I share from my end? Uh, and kindly share from your end if you're able. Okay. I will do that. And, and maybe as Anne shares from our end, I see uh, on the chat box uh, people indicating that they are not able to hear us. Are we, uh, uh, are there certain people who are having problems or is, is every one of us who is not able to hear us? Dr. Karagwa, I can hear you. I think yeah. perhaps okay. those who are not able to hear, they might check their uh, their sound connection. Okay. Yeah, their audios. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Bot. So, Anne Coril, please go go ahead and make your presentation. Okay. So I will stop my video. Okay. So, um, so we are looking at. A breast ca cancer burden, and I'll just take you through a background and uh, just a few statistics from our local data. So we all know that um, worldwide, lung cancer is the leading um, malignancy, and it's closely followed by breast cancer. So breast cancer really is among the leading uh, cancers that we see globally. So as you can see, it comes in the second after lung cancer. And uh, breast cancer contributes approximately 11.6% um, of total cases worldwide and about 25% of the new cancer cases among female were due to breast. So again, just looking at female only, about 25% of those cases are breast cancer cases. So you can see that the burden um, globally is, is really very, very high. Um, Again, um, Dr. Karagu, are you able to, I think I will just, I will use these other sides because I can see that um, on my left side, it is a bit blocked. So I cannot be able to look at my slides. Okay. Um, kindly, so, could you try and uh, use uh, the the um, the slideshow mode? Sorry. Okay. Let Please me move this. Uh, slideshow mode. Yeah. Let me let me do that. Okay. I will just move this to this other corner so I can be able to see. Okay, so um, let's continue. So as I was saying, so breast cancer incidents contribute to um, about 6.6% of total cancer deaths. So when you look at um, mortality, so breast cancer contributes to about 6.6% and globally 15% of all cancer deaths among female were due to breast. So again, when you look at the burden among the women, you can see that breast cancer really um, is one of the high leading causes of mortality. So, um, okay, so let's continue. I will move very quickly because I was given only 10 minutes. So looking at mortality, you can look at this chart here from the Sub-Saharan Africa region, and you can see that um, breast cancer contributes about 11% of, um, of mortality. Um, while here on the lead here, I don't know whether you can see my cancer, we have cervical cancer then breast cancer coming in second, prostate cancer, liver cancer, colorectal, esophageal cancer, non Hodgkin's, and then all the other cancers. So you can see breast cancer uh, in terms of mortality comes in second after cervical cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, okay? And this is just a slide to look at survival. Again, um, you can see that in, in um, Nairobi here, we have 
This was data from the Africa Cancer Registries Network. And from the Africa Cancer Registries Network, we have several registries within this network. Most of these are population-based um, cancer registries. So uh, usually they conduct studies on different types of cancers, looking at survival. And we can see this was, uh, we have Nairobi here as one of the registries and that contributed uh, the data uh, among the, um, the Sub-Saharan African countries. So overall, the relative survival at one year for the entire cohort was 86.1%. Um, and then we had about 63 to 65 at three years and 59% as 56 to 61% uh, at five years. So the relative survival was significantly low for late stage breast cancers where the relative survival was about 40.3%. So for this was specifically for the stages three and four, the survival was about 40%. But when the staging uh, information when we diagnose the patients at early stages, then you find that survival is much higher. But for those diagnosed at stage three, stage four, then you find the survival is way low, less than 50%. So in Kenya, when we come closer home and look at the statistics from Kenya, as you may all know that in Kenya, we have two main registries, Nairobi and Eldoret, which are population-based registries and have been in existence for uh, close to 20 years. But over time, we have worked to see that we also expand to other counties because of the need to uh, document more data that can be representative for our country. And so from 2016, uh, working together with other, other partners, we had an expansion program where we established more registries in various counties. And I know they face many, many challenges, but despite all these challenges, they've been able to generate some data that really gives us some indication on the kind of cancers that we see in our country. And um, again, as you all know, we have the act that was uh, uh, established in 2012 that, that established the National Cancer Institute of Kenya. And this act mandates NCI to oversee establishment of more registries and um, a national cancer registry. And so um, I know that NCI has been in the process of uh, you know, developing a system where cancer cases are, when, when cancer is diagnosed, it is notified to NCI so that we can have better data, um, more robust data covering the whole country. So if we could have all our pathologists, our you know, specialists who diagnose cancer, clinicians, just ensuring that NCI are notified, then we would have better, more representative data across the country. So we are hoping that we will continue working together with NCI, the Ministry of Health, um, so that we can expand cancer registration in the country. So just quickly, again, to look at the current data from um, our local setting in Kenya. So this is um, data from Globocan. And as you know, Globocan is estimated from the Nairobi and Eldoret population-based registries. And you can see that the most recent data shows that breast cancer was on the lead um, with over 5,000 cases, 5,985 cases, um, followed closely by cervical cancer, cancer of esophagus and then colorectal cancer, stomach cancer in that order. So as you see, breast cancer really um, is on the lead in Kenya. It's actually the leading cancer overall and the leading uh, among women followed very, very closely by cervical cancer. So I, I want to quickly look at uh, some of the population-based data. So as you know, Nairobi is one of the population-based data covering Nairobi County. And just from the recent, most recent data, you can see that um, breast cancer uh, still remained on the lead. And this has been the trend for quite some time now. Um, even in the early years, we still saw that breast cancer was on the lead, but it was closely followed by cervical cancer. And in some years, cervical cancer would top up followed by breast. But over time, you can see 
just based on the number of cases, I did not put incidence rates here, but just based on the number of cases, um, you can see that breast cancer is on the lead and closely followed by cervical cancer, colorectal, lymphomas, esophageal, in that order. So, um, so breast cancer really is a cancer that we should all be concerned. Um, and especially when you look at um, the age at diagnosis. Again, I don't know whether you are able to see my slide properly. Let me move this down. Um, so you can see this graph here. Um, this is incidence and you can see who is being diagnosed by this. Who is getting breast cancer in Kenya? It's women aged 30 to 49 years. And that makes up over 50% of the cases, 30 to 49 years. If we ask ourselves, who are the 30 to 49 years? I think I'd say majority of us, even in this meeting, we are at risk of this disease. And therefore we really need to be able to um, come up with strategies where we can uh, be able to prevent this disease affecting our women. And you can see um, 50 to 69, um, 37%. And then look at the, on the side of mortality. This is uh, the slide on your right, looking at the deaths. Again, it follows almost similar pattern. We are losing women uh, age 30 to 49 to breast cancer and followed also closely by um, you know, the 50 to 69 age group. Uh, when you look at, uh, when you look at data from another county, this is Kisumu County, you can see that breast cancer in Kisumu County was on the, was the, was the second diagnosed uh, cancer after cervical cancer, right? So overall, again, uh, cervical cancer was on the lead for this particular county, but breast cancer still remains high. So you can see the, the pink uh, shade there. Breast cancer is also um, quite high in this county, followed by esophageal cancer, and then the lymphomas, liver cancer, colorectal in that order. So, uh, so again, breast cancer is a concern here. Let's look at uh, the other county. I think I cannot see my screen. This is Meru County. So Meru County, you can see that breast cancer is leading in this particular county. Uh, breast cancer is on the lead, followed closely by cervical cancer, uh, stomach cancer, esophageal, colorectal in that order. So again, um, this is what we are seeing in most of the counties where we have established some registries. I know that I cannot be able to uh, give you data from many of these counties because we like to give data that is, uh, has been checked for completeness, for accuracy, to be uh, certain that this is the case on the ground. So, but just sampling a few of these counties where we have more complete data, you can see that breast cancer is really coming up as um, one of the cancers to be concerned about. This is Mombasa County. And again, you can see it is almost similar trend, breast cancer, cervical cancer, esophageal, then oropharyngeal cancers are also high in this particular county. So again, this is a concern. And I would say that from across several of the counties where we have a bit of data, some of them maybe even not complete enough, but it's still, you still see that this particular cancer is coming up strongly as a cancer that um, is on the lead affecting our women. And the most concern, uh, the biggest concern is that these cases are, 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 you know, are common among the younger age groups. Women who are aged 30 years to 40 years, 49 years, these are women who are still highly productive in the society. And so it is also a concern, even in terms of economics, in terms of family livelihoods, because it is affecting, um, you know, the, 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 the age group that, you know, these people should be providing for their families, but instead they're now worrying about their medical care. And, you know, some of them also, and, and uh, we end up losing them to this disease. So I wanted to quickly go through this you know, the need to have good documentation as well. We are all healthcare professionals and um, most of you, I think, who are connected here, um, medical doctors, nurses, you meet these patients first and when they come to the facility. 
our biggest challenge as cancer registrars is that we don't find good data. You know, data management, the facilities is quite poor. And I want to encourage each of us to really be, be, be very keen on how you're managing your data in your facility. How you manage your data will also determine how you care for that patient. If a patient comes in today, you open a patient file, they come in six months later, you don't even retrieve that old file, you just open a new one, then there is no continuity of care for this patient. So there is need for us to improve on how we manage our data. We have so many challenges for us to be able to provide this kind of statistics for all of us to make use of and to make decisions, to make informed decisions. We require to have quality data that uh, is submitted to the cancer registry. We have people called cancer registrars. Their work is to uh, ensure that they package this data in the right way for the cancer registry so that it's consumed appropriately. But they face so many challenges. You find important variables like age are missing. You know, someone has just written unknown. Uh, you know, you find place of residence, it's missing. I will not be able to, to tell you these are patients from this particular county if you are not documenting place of residence where these patients are coming from. So for us to adequately study the trends over time, because that is what we do as surveillance officers, as epidemiologists, we want to look at trends over time. I look forward to a day when I see the graph of breast cancer coming down, then I can be able to say, really, all our interventions you know, are bearing fruits. But that will also be informed on how good is the data that we are collecting. So adequately um, capturing all the variables. A, a number of places I've visited in the counties, even the lab reports that should contain tumor information is missing in the patient file, right? So the patient you know, maybe went home with the report and there's no copy in the patient file. So my, uh, my plea to all our healthcare workers is that how you manage the data also uh, impacts on how you manage or how you care for the patient. So let us do proper patient uh, data management. So as I conclude, I'd like to say that, um, you know, the survival data shows us that we are, you know, diagnosing these cancers late. And a lot of studies have shown that it's not necessarily that the patient went to the facility late. In some cases, the patient actually went early, but they never got the services at the time they should have gotten. They were referred and back and forth and, you know, misdiagnosis along the way. Let us do proper referrals. Let us do, um, you know, guide our patients adequately so that they don't stay until it is too late. And then we are uh, uh, diagnosing these cancers at stage three, stage four. If we can diagnose them at stage one, you know, or even earlier, if we can even do screening, roll out screening programs uh, in the counties, I think we would begin to look at uh, trends coming down or at least having less of the stage three, stage four cancers. Um, so uh, again, as researchers, again, I believe we have many researchers here. I think we need to continuously do further research. Let's look at um, risk factors affecting, especially this younger community, this younger, you know, my, my question is always why the young age group? You know, when I compare our data with data from, um, you know, other countries, you know, I look at some of these countries, they are diagnosing these cancers at the age of 50 years, 60 years. We are diagnosing at age 30. What could be the risk factors? We may probably need to look at, look at it in the local perspective and, you know, just studying our local women adequately to be able to have uh, adequate data that you can make uh, conclusions and be able to intervene and have, uh, you know, be, be able to prevent these cancers from occurring among these patients. Uh, so we need to continue doing our surveillance um, for the cancer registrars who are connected here. I encourage you to continue doing your work, continue developing your population-based registries in your counties. Uh, let us support these people, you know, uh, the, the medical, personnel who are here. This data is for, for you, for all of us. Let us support the cancer registrars, the medical records officers who are busy putting this data together, together. So let us support them. Let us build good cancer registries so that we can have adequate data. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, all 
the people who have supported us over time. Thank you, MOH, for organizing this forum and all our partners. We are not able to do this work on our own. All our partners who support us to get good data for the cancer registry. I want to acknowledge uh, you for that. And also, thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank you. And back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. I think that was a very uh, good and detailed presentation that has set the stage uh, for us to go into, into uh, other elements around breast cancer. I think it's very clear that breast cancer is a key problem. Uh, when you look across the, uh, the counties, it's one of the uh, biggest uh, concern. So uh, we, I, I think the message is home that we need to really focus on breast cancer. So next, I will invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Board from the National who will take us through some policy perspectives around um, uh, breast cancer prevention. So Dr. Board, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Karagu. I hope I'm clearly audible. And uh, I'm here to talk about policy around uh, breast cancer. Uh, I, as Dr. Karagu said, I'm with the National Cancer Control Program. And uh, I'll take us through quick facts on breast cancer, global policy perspectives, look at the Kenyan policy environment, look at the importance of data and monitoring and evaluation, briefly at barriers and challenges, and then I will conclude. Uh, as you have heard, uh, breast cancer is the most common type of cancer overall in Kenya. Seven women die as a result of breast cancer, also affecting a younger age group. And uh, I don't think I will belabor that. So uh, what is happening in, at policy level um, globally? And uh, the general considerations that we should know is that uh, breast cancer, um, is that breast cancer control programs are effective when they are part of a comprehensive cancer control plans that are appropriate in terms of uh, the resource uh, setting of the country. The, the breast cancer control plans must link with accurate diagnosis and timely treatment in terms of infrastructure and capacity to manage increased numbers of asymptomatic cancers. Uh, in terms of policy planning, uh, it is recommended to have plans that are long-term that are integrated overall into the health system. So the emphasis here is on integration and uh, data is needed to drive improvements in uh, programs. Uh, again, on the, still on the policy environment, uh, WHO proposes two strategies for breast cancer early detection. One is early diagnosis and two is screening and I will not pre preempt the definitions that is uh, the work of the next speaker, uh, but um, the specific guidelines and policy documents at a global level, uh, there's a WHO position paper on mammography screening that uh, addresses asymptomatic women at, who are at average risk for breast cancer. It segments them into different age groups and different settings. That is a 2014 document. There's also a 2013 document that guides referral of suspected breast cancer at primary healthcare uh, low resource settings. So those are important documents and I have indicated there the link to the first one, the second one I was not able to trace. But what is happening at um, the local level here in Kenya in terms of policy? Uh, these are the policy documents that uh, we have. We have um, the Kenya Cancer Policy, we have uh, the, Ken the National Cancer Control Strategy, we have screening guidelines and we have treatment protocols and all these documents are available online. What you may notice is that the cancer policy uh, uh, was uh, launched in, actually it was launched in 2020, but it runs from 2019 to 2030. The strategy came before the policy, a case of a mother coming before a baby, but the national, can, they are, the documents are well aligned and uh, one of course anchors on the other. And uh, 
they are also aligned with other national and international documents. When you look at the Kenya Cancer Policy, it provides a framework to comprehensively address cancer control in Kenya through imp implementing evidence-based interventions uh, systematically for the entire cancer prevention and control uh, framework. So it has strategic directions and it guides us in that way. When you look at the National Cancer Control Strategy, um, this one, as I said, runs, we are now midway with this strategy, with the implementation, and um, the National Cancer Control Program is tasked to bring together the different stakeholders to implement this strategy. So it's not an MOH document only, it's for all stakeholders implementing cancer control in this country. The vision is to have a Kenya population with a low burden of cancer, and how will we achieve this through implementing a coordinated and responsive cancer control framework that will lead to reduction of mortality and morbidity? How through effective partnerships and collaborations for all the aspects of cancer care, uh, cancer control and prevention in order to achieve the well being of Kenyans? The goal overall, therefore, is to reduce cancer incidence, mortality, and morbidity. When you look at the cancer strategy, and this is how we have structured uh, our work at the cancer uh, control program, we have pillar one, which is, uh, we have five strategic pillars. Pillar one is on prevention, early detection and screening. Pillar two is on diagnosis, registration and surveillance. Pillar three is on treatment, uh, palliative care and survivorship. And pillar four uh, addresses coordination, partnership and financing. And all these come um, together under the cross-cutting pillar of MND and research. When we look at uh, pillar one, we have the National Cancer Control ca Cancer Screening Guidelines, which we are implementing uh, with a view of having a, a, an organized and unified approach to cancer screening at both levels of government and across uh, the health sector from private to public. And these are the recommendations specifically for breast cancer screening. Uh, mammography is the recommended method. There are other methods, and I will let uh, our final speaker of the day speak into this. Uh, the guidelines also provide um, um, details and guidance on the age to start screening and the frequency for the screening. But for average risk women, uh, all women between age 40 and 74 should be getting screened using mammogram. Um, we are looking at a comprehensive approach. Uh, we have the national cancer treatment protocols, but before that, we have the cancer specimen handling guidelines. This one is a work in progress. It is, it is almost being finalized because we realized that we need to guide on how specimens are handled because a cancer diagnosis is really based on histology. And so that is very important. That's not the official cover. It's just something I put there to show that there's something in progress. And then we also uh, address cancer care in terms of palliative care, survivorship and rehabilitation. When it comes to monitoring and evaluation, which is very important in policy, what is the role of data in, in a breast cancer program? One, it helps us to identify problems. Uh, it helps us to make informed decisions. It helps us to measure our impact. You know, you can be working all this time working very hard and making no impact. So you need data as uh, Anne, uh, the earlier presenter uh, mentioned and really emphasized strategic planning is also guided by data. Data also guides the management of logistics and also guides operational research. Those are just some of the reasons why we need good data. These are the cancer screening uh, tools, the, the data tools that are available and uh, they should be available at uh, all levels of care, especially the cancer screening um, tools because cancer screening is supposed to be happening from level, level one is information and education of the community, level two, level three that continues and we begin having screening in form of complete uh, breast exams, which you need to document in the cancer screening register MOH 412, and then summarize 
uh, in the monthly summary, MOH 745. Where cancer treatment is available, there is a cancer treatment register together with a monthly summary. Now, what are some barriers that we see to cancer, breast cancer prevention and control? We have uh, st structural barriers. These are access barriers like uh, when services are not well coordinated, when we have uh, referral networks not being strong, when we have lack of patient navigation systems, uh, HR capacity issues, geographical distribution of services. For example, now in this country, a big problem we've had over time is that these services have been available mostly in Nairobi. Uh, for example, radiotherapy only at Kenyatta. And uh, that is something that we are addressing at the National Cancer Control Program. Uh, and together with the other stakeholders in the cancer control space. The other barriers are social cultural barriers like stigma, myths and misconceptions, poor linkages between health facilities and communities. But this uh, is something that can be addressed through the community strategy and through health education. On a personal uh, level, there's poor health literacy among the communities, among individuals, poor awareness of risk factors and early detection, and also psychosocial barriers to treatment for those who are um, going through cancer treatment. Financial barriers, uh, lack of health insurance. A uh, lot of people wait until they are sick to get NHIF. And you know there are a lot of issues there and high out-of-pocket expenditure is very common when there is a cancer diagnosis in a family. Specific challenges to Kenya, we have a low uptake of screening services According to the KDHS uh, survey that was done in 2014, only 25% of women of reproductive age had performed a self-examination for breast cancer. Only 14% had had a doctor or a health provider perform for them, you know, a complete breast exam. We have low awareness of screening services. We have late diagnosis, as uh, uh, the first presenter uh, mentioned. We have inadequate uh, treatment services and diagnostic facilities with insufficient equipment, personnel, and consumables. We have suboptimal cancer registration and surveillance, and that's why we are really emphasizing on the need for data. And then very specifically, there's a low utilization rate of mammography. As at 2018, out of all the women who are eligible for, uh, for mammography, only, uh, 1320, 1,000 had received mammography. And even now we find that mammograms are used more for diagnosis than for, treat, than for screening, even where they are available in all the 47 county referral hospitals. So in conclusion, uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, our policies, the policies that we have in this country, they are adequate to provide the legal and implementation frameworks that can guide uh, developing and delivering cancer services at both levels of government. There are challenges and barriers uh, that, will, that exist that hinder implementation. However, all stakeholders coming together, everybody playing their role, these barriers can be addressed uh, systematically. Uh, I would also just like to conclude uh, by acknowledging uh, the organizers, uh, specifically the National Prevention, Cancer Prevention, Screening and Early Diagnosis Technical Working Group and the committees therein that have made these webinars possible. And thank you to KNH for hosting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bor, uh, for that um, wonderful presentation. I think uh, now we are more uh, familiar with the, the various policy frameworks that exist around uh, cancer in general, and more particularly breast cancer. Uh, I just want to uh, remind our, our participants that um, as we go through the discussion, we anticipate to have a session for uh, question and answer. So really, we can use uh, the chat box uh, to send in any questions. Uh, I, I think I've seen one or two uh, that have been submitted. But uh, we look forward to receiving many more questions from the audience so that our, our panel of speakers can you know can can give some responses at the end of uh, this uh, webinar and uh, I'm also I also note that uh, 
participants continue to provide their details uh, uh, for purposes of some reimbursements for airtime. So let us continue providing these details uh, on the chat box. I will move to the third uh, presenter uh, who is going to talk to us, who is going to introduce some concepts around um, screening, around uh, early detection, around prevention, uh, so that we understand what all this means. Before now, we have some more detailed presentations uh, from a clinical, from a clinician as, a, as our last speaker. So I want to uh, introduce uh, Ben Bella Onino, uh, an oncology nurse uh, working at Kenyatta National Hospital, and also a member of the oncology nursing chapter, to briefly talk to us about uh, uh, definitions around the key concepts on screening, primary prevention and early detection. So Ben Bella, uh, please uh, take over. Are you there, Ben Bella? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Well, Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Dr. Karabu. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Okay, we'll start by further by defining. Well, once again, let me thank you, Dr. Karagu, for the brief introduction. We'll start by going through what I'll be presenting. We we'll start by the be breast cancer definition. Uh, there you go. Okay, you will be doing primary prevention, definition, uh, screening, and early diagnosis. Dr. Sari, maybe you can put it in the other mode. Yeah, the top here, yeah, great. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay, you start by definitions of primary prevention, screening, and early diagnosis. As Dr. Karabar introduced, I'm Bembelo Nino. I'm an oncology nurse in Kenyatta National Hospital Cancer Treatment Center. We'll define breast cancer, then go through anatomy of the breast. And then we will also go through the risk factors for breast cancer, then primary prevention, the definitions. Okay, breast cancer is definition is abnormal multiplication, abnormal and rapid multiplication of breast cancer, breast, breast cells. And then it mostly affects women, men rarely, of which uh, in percentage, it is less, less than 1% of men are affected by breast cancer. The anatomy for the breast, each breast, as you can see from the diagram, each breast has 15 to 20, lobes arranged in a petal way. These are the lobes, as you can see from the diagram, and these are the ducts. Uh, inside each lobe are many smaller structures called lobules. At the end of each lobule, tiny bulbs for, for the lobes, main purpose is for the production of, say, of milk. Then the duct is for, for is the tube that carries the, the milk from, from the lobes. It lies on the ovalis pectoris muscles in the chest wall, connected to muscles by fibers called corpus ligament. Now we go to the risk factors. By definition, a risk factor is something that increases a person's chances of developing a cancer. Now, in, among the risk factors, we have age. It's more common amongst women above 40 years of age. Gender, more common in women. As I said uh, earlier, said one percent occurs in men. Then there's also race and uh, ethnicity. There's a family history, a, fam a first degree, or by first degree I mean a mother, a daughter, or a sister. Then also there's a uh, diagnosis risk of if done at, at, at a younger age. Also, the another risk factor is exposure to radiation, uh, especially during treatment for using ionizing radiation to the chest wall. Example in treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Other risk factors are personal history of breast cancer. 
that's the contralateral breast cancer. Uh, there also there is a history of a previous history of ovarian cancer. If a client had, uh, if a patient had uh, ovarian cancer or endometrial cancer, risks are also very high of developing breast cancer because of the genes mutation. They are similar the BRCA1 and the BRCA2. There is also hormonal factors, uh, long exposure to estrogen due to early onset of menses of, of menstrual period that is before the age of 12 and also late menopause. Then there's also a history of nulliparity. By menopause is if the, if it, it, it basically it's due to the long exposure of long for a long duration in, in all the instances that I've given above. There's also life, life, lifestyle factors, example in obesity and uh, high dietary fat is also associated with the risk for breast, breast cancer in postmenopausal women since estrogen is producing the fat, tissue, fat tissues of most obese women. High consumption of alcohol, also the type of alcohol, the duration for consumption of alcohol also comes into factor in, risk, in the risk factors to developing breast cancer. There's also breast density has also been associated in the breast density. Uh, what I can highlight there is uh, you find um, in um, most women with the less fatty tissues, there's more glandular and fibrous tissues, which may be also a higher degree risk of developing breast cancer as compared to women with the less dense breast. Still on continuation of risk factors, no, the, now we we'll go to primary prevention. But by primary prevention, we you can define it as it's a set of intervention that keeps the cancerous process from developing. So there are several steps to, of several factors which uh, an individual can do in order to prevent somebody from developing cancer, which include prevention of other chronic diseases, or uh, which here we can talk about HIV, human papilloma viruses, uh, or HIV, sorry, sorry, HIV which normally causes low immunity and they also has been associated with cancer. Then avoidance of radiation, uh, occupational and environmental exposures, uh, at, especially for those who work in radiation field areas to avoid overexposure. Well, but here we talk about the Alara principles of which we know about the time, the distance, the shielding, et cetera. Then about promotion of healthy diets by eating food rich, that's rich and, which is rich in fruits, vegetables, legumes, uh, and also low in saturated fats. Also other means for prevention is regular and physical activity to maintain a healthy body, a healthy body weight. Also there is minimizing of exposure to aflatoxins in food, among others. Also on the list of preventions, we have tobacco and alcohol control of which uh, we, when it comes to alcohol and tobacco control, we talk, I will talk more of the advertisement of which it, more of is following the government by restriction or, of advertisements of uh, consumption of alcohol and tobacco control, because they have been associated also to high risk, uh, risk of developing cancer. Okay, on the primary prevention, health education, uh, key messages of, of, of breast self-examination and breast awareness, we should, uh, we should also emphasize on knowledge on uh, breast self-examination, how to do it, when to do it, uh, to most of our clients who come to our facilities. So on this, uh, we have to develop the knowledge of what is normal in your breast. You see, also it's very important to know the normal breast, how it looks, discuss the, health, health, the breast health awareness with your healthcare provider, then report any abnormality noted in your breast. Self breast examination and clinical examination. Breast examination are complementary, but do not substitute mammography by screening. By clinical breast examination, we mean, I mean, uh, there's a self breast examination, which will advise most of our clients to be doing. Then there's a clinical, which now is performed by a clinician. After a certain duration of one to three years, we advise clients to be doing it after several years of doing breast self-examination. 
asymptomatic women above 40 years require baseline mammography screening. All ladies that we should encourage, all ladies who are above 40 years, at least to be doing it yearly or after or three years, depending on their clinicians' advice on, and also the risk factors for the women, for, for, for the client coming to the facility to be doing a mammography. Okay, as I said, earlier, breast cancer can also occur in men, so very rare, but they still need to have the awareness of breast cancer in men. Okay, early, detect early detection. Uh, definition, it, it includes screening and early diagnosis. So in early detection of cancer, greatly increases the chances for successful treatment. You find most cancers, if you, if you diagnose them very early, since this month we are, we are dealing with breast cancer, if it's diagnosed very early, the outcome for treatment will be successful and also the prognosis will be good. As later on, we'll, be, we'll see uh, the importance of doing screenings for most cancer patients or for most clients who come to a facility, for most women. Okay, by, defini by definition, breast cancer screening is refers to the use of simple tests, mammogram across a healthy population in order to to, uh, to do and uh, uh, recognize disease in individual before they develop symptoms of, of, of the cancer. It's a process and starts with the invitation, uh, get tested and must end with follow-up and leakage to care to ensure treatment of confirmed cases. Uh, that after you have done the screening, you have, first of all, you have to make an awareness to the public to be clear about the breast cancer, like you've been doing this month, once they come to the facility, once they have test tested, the case that turn out to be positive, you have to ensure you make a follow up. Also, the case that you find are at risk factors, the, risk, the high risk factors, and also the average risk factors, you should be also be making a follow up of other clients so that we may detect this cancer at a very early stage. That's the reason why we are doing the screenings so that we may detect this cancer at a very early stage. As, an, as one of my colleagues had talked earlier, if we diagnose this disease at a very early stage, the outcome is good. Okay, early diagnosis by, the diagnosis by definition is detection of symptomatic patients as early as possible, then the recognition of possible cancer warning signs so as to do a prompt action. Can, it, it can be achieved by increasing awareness of possible warning signs of cancer among health care providers and general public uh, through education. I think by there is just self-explanatory. So just to bring it to almost a closure, you can talk about the importance of screening. Why do we do screen? Why do we want to do screen to the public? It's so that we may detect the uh, breast cancer at a very early stage when it's easy to treat. When most cancers come at a late stage, because in our, most of our facilities, they come at a very late stage. That's uh, having a poor prognosis and also the cost of treatment goes very high. So, the later the stage the patient presents, the more the cost, the more expensive it becomes to treat it. So the earlier the patient presents, the easier it is to manage. Then uh, the other reason is so that we increase the survival rate for breast cancer patients. If you diagnose very early, as I said earlier, the prognosis is good, then the survival rate will be high. We have seen patients who have come to our facilities at a very early stage, and they're now doing more than 20 years plus after the diagnosis because it was diagnosed at a very early stage. Also, it, it improved on making lifestyle changes. Once, once we do the screening, we also educate the public on lifestyle changes, like uh, we have talked about the cons high consumption of alcohol, tobacco, exposure to radiations. Once we have sensed the people, they'll go back to their society and at least they'll do some, adjust some changes in their lifestyle on how, how they live on their daily to day, day to day life. Then also the other important, for the, uh, the other importance for doing screening is to knowing the risk factors. You find there is high risk and also the, 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 there is the average risk. So by doing the screening, when you are doing the history of your client and doing the education and uh, creating the awareness to our clients, you, are, you want to also to know who are the higher risk, who are the, at the higher risk of developing breast cancer amongst our clientele by passing information to them so that they be able to categorize themselves. Are they at a higher risk or average risk of developing breast cancer? So by this knowing, at least they can be able to be doing continuous screening on themselves by doing breast self-examination and the CBE and the mammography 
as advised by the clinician, by the doctor when they come to their facilities. In conclusion, breast cancer, it, uh, it mostly affects women and is rare in men. Uh, primary, uh, then primary prevention is through avoidance of risk factors, which I mentioned earlier on, the risk factors which you remember. Uh, then early, de early detection through screening and early diagnosis is the key in breast cancer prevention. Then early detection of cancer greatly increases the chances of successful treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben Bella, for that presentation, uh, taking us through the definition so that we understand what, when we talk about primary prevention, what we mean, the difference between screening, early detection, early diagnosis, all this is important. I think now we are, we are, we are going to the last uh, presenter before we go to the uh, Q&A session. And I allow me to welcome uh, Dr. Moki uh, Mwenda, uh, who's a surgeon um, specializing in um, uh, oncoplastic, uh, he's actually a breast oncoplastic surgeon. And uh, he'll be talking to us uh, or going deeper into approaches and techniques for screening and early diagnosis. And also just uh, give a, f I know a broad overview of uh, diagnosis and treatment for breast cancer. So Dr. Moki, uh, please uh, share your screens and go, uh, share your screen and uh, give us your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Dr. Karago, for the introduction. My name is Dr. Moki Mwendo. I'm a general surgeon as well as an oncoplastic breast surgeon. And I'll be going through this last session of um, this webinar. <clears throat> um, one minute, please. All right. <clears throat> So um, I'll be um, discussing a little bit on um, screening and early diagnosis, the approaches that we have and the techniques. I'll also do an overview of the signs and symptoms of breast cancer and a quick overview as well on the diagnosis, modality and treatment. Um, I had, uh, I was supposed to start a little bit earlier, but it um, seems like a lot of time or some time I've been taken off, so I'll try and be a bit quicker. Um, so when it, when it comes to screening, we've already gotten a, a, a definition of that, which they are simple um, population-based population um, either examination modalities or investigations, which are, ident are aimed at identifying a particular disease state, usually at the time when it is asymptomatic. And of course, there are several ways and uh, decisions of um, like deciding which is the best modality for um, screening. Um, specifically for breast cancer, um, the aim is early detection of the cancer. So we've already, we can not overemphasize this that early detection means a better prognosis, better outcome of treatment, um, longer overall survival, and longer disease-free uh, disease state. Um, when we have early detection, of course, the treatment modalities are more, and uh, you don't necessarily need to get the more invasive or um, you know, ex expansive sorts of um, treatment. And as we, as we have also said, there's reduced mortality and morbidity. So specifically for uh, breast cancer, mammography is the recommended uh, method of screening for women in the average risk population. Uh, most cancers uh, occur in this um, 
population that we have defined as average risk. And uh, for that purpose, because only about um, five to ten percent of cancers occur as um, genetic predisposition or familial preponderance or familial um, risk, then uh, we have this group, which is the bigger majority, which will benefit uh, from screening. And as we have said, these are population-based um, uh, uh, investigations or examinations. Uh, there are other uh, approaches as well of uh, screening. Uh, so um, there's a clinical breast examination, which we will talk about uh, later in, the, in this uh, slide, slideshow. Um, we ha also have ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound usually is not a screening tool for breast cancer. Uh, but mostly is uh, used as, a, as, a, an, as, as an adjunct. Occasionally for patients who have, um, especially for patients who have um, high breast density, patients who will need uh, screening uh, at an earlier age for one reason or the other may also benefit from um, ultrasound. Um, ultrasound can also be utilized when there are other um, suspicious uh, areas seen on mammograms um, where we are talking about uh, um, multicentric cancers or uh, multifocal cancers, either cancers which are in different areas or suspicious areas on mammograms which are seen in different areas of the breast. So you may need to, to use an ultrasound as an adjunct to mammogram. Uh, Self-breast examination uh, has been mentioned a couple of times. It's um, it's not um, WHO recommendation, but uh, it is a very useful tool. I would say it's a useful tool for our population because some, some cancers or some breast diseases will be able to be picked probably before they have advanced. And uh, if the population is well-educated, then they can either self-refer refer themselves or book an appointment with their, with their doctors for appropriate examination. And in terms of uh, breast uh, self-awareness, we it has also been mentioned before uh, that patients need to know their breast and we will mention this as we go as well. Now, in terms of um, screening for the different age groups, that is um, in terms of um, their, for those below the age of 35, that is um, 25 to 34, the national recommendations are um, three yearly clinical breast examination by your clinician. In this age group, of course, a mammogram is not uh, recommended as it has been mentioned earlier that um, high breast density will hinder visualization of some suspicious lesions. So a clinical breast examination is appropriate. Uh, from the age of 35 to 39, um, one to three yearly clinical breast examination and an ultrasound or a mammogram would be appropriate every year or to three yearly, depending on what has been found from any clinical uh, breast examination. From the age of 40, um, it is advisable to have a mammogram done for any patient who has not had one. Uh, so this should be advised and an annual cl clinical breast examination. Beyond the age of 55, uh, it's, um, the national guidelines again are um, two yearly clinical breast examination and a two yearly mammogram. Uh, beyond the age of um, uh, 75, um, it's about um, considering individual health and preference of um, screening or examination depending on the risk of the patient. Uh, we are assuming that this would be a patient who has gone through the several categories in terms of whether she has been um, evaluated before. I will talk about self-breast examination in terms of what 
um, as clinicians, the information that we would want to pass on to the patients. So, um, so the advice is that the, um, the patient should be should stand in front of a mirror. I will just go uh, uh, along um, the slides or the pictures as they are. Um, so with arms lifted and, and looking at the mirror, you're looking at the breasts in terms of um, symmetry, contours, whether there are areas where there's dimpling or um, areas which are looking different in terms of the skin. Are there areas which are pulled in or pulled out? Is the, are the nipples pointing the, in the same direction? And again, I should also emphasize that all the, the breasts are not always symmetrical. So the size may be a little bit different or um, a little bit deviation in terms of the direction which is pointing, but that should not hinder you from identifying differences as time goes by. Um, so arms up, look, evaluate, arms down, arms akimbo, press down uh, on the hips so that you tense the chest muscles and see if there's difference in mobility or movement of the breast. Uh, to identify whether there's some um, tissues which are anchored or tethered down uh, to the chest wall. Again, arms down and look for the same. We are looking for symmetry. We are looking for contours and any differences in the nipple areola complex as well. When it comes to examination, so there are two ways of going about it. I'll start with the first one, either while in the shower with the, uh, with the hands leathered with soap, so you go around the whole breast. This has been mentioned before that you ensure that you examine all quadrants of the breast um, with, the, with the tips of the fingers, which are more sensitive. So there are three ways of going about it. So you can either do the radio method where you are going like clockwise, say from uh, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, um, two o'clock, going round and round until you cover the whole of the breast. And again, we must emphasize you should not forget to examine the nipple and areola complex, as well as the axilla or the armpit. The other way of going about it is a spiral. You can start from the nipple areola complex area going round and round uh, until the whole breast is covered or the vertical method where you start either from the medial aspect or the outer aspect, whichever way you choose, examining uh, all, the breasts, all the breast tissues and again cover the areola and the axilla. The other way um, is um, by lying down with the arm on the breast which is being examined under the head. And uh, again, using either of these methods, you cover the whole breast, uh, feeling for differences in consistency, feeling for areas which have lumps, feeling even areas which are, have focal tenderness. Um, then finally, I'll mention that you also need to sit in the, in the examination uh, using the mirror, sit and lean forward and again, look for those um, uh, differences or um, areas of, of um, suspicious um, foci. Um, we, the, the importance and the points to, to identify about uh, self-breast examination have been mentioned earlier. I will not deliver that. Uh, there are different um, groups. Sorry about that. So there, suppose there are some different risk groups which will require um, uh, screening differently. So there are high risk groups which are defined as those with affected uh, first degree relatives. This has been mentioned before. Those who have previously had abnormal uh, breast biopsies, those who have previously had uh, chest wall irradiation, ionizing radiation, um, those with previous uh, breast cancer, either to the same breast or um, the contralateral breast. So for those who have had the uh, first uh, um, family history of uh, breast cancer, the first degree uh, relatives, the recommendation is uh, clinical breast examination starting from the age um, of 25, um, then annual mammograms starting 10 years younger than the youngest um, uh, relative who had breast cancer, uh, but not earlier than the age of 25 and not later than the age of 40. 
And then uh, you may also need complementary imaging, like ultrasound and MRI, uh, in addition to the mammogram. Um, those for those who have had previous um, uh, biopsies showing either typical like aplasia or lob lobular carcinoma in situ, then the recommendation would be a clinical breast examination every six to twelve months and an annual mammogram. Uh, similarly, to those who have had uh, previous chest wall irradiation, recommendation would be a clinical breast examination every six to twelve months and an annual mammogram. Now, um, for um, clinical examination or evaluation for a breast disease, uh, ideal, the ideal uh, recommendation would be what we call triple assessment. For triple assessment, it means you're getting a clinical examination, you're getting an imaging evaluation, and you're also getting um, a biopsy or um, tissue examination. So, the ideal um, situation would be what we, we, we call a one-stop clinic or rapid access clinic where all those um, services will be accessed, although this has not yet um, been developed in our setup. So in the clinical assessment, we will want to know the, you know, there's the, the, the breast history, which will mainly be focusing on the risk factors, which um, uh, Ben Bella has, has mentioned before. And then from that, we will do the clinical examination where we are, we are looking and feeling for any um, suspicious areas. And then from there, we recommend the appropriate imaging investigation. This is um, most of the time will include a mammogram and probably another investigation, uh, commonly um, an ultrasound. After that, um, a uh, biopsy, if it's possible within the same city, if it's not possible uh, because our setup is not developed in that manner, then this can be arranged for a biopsy to be obtained at a later date. And then uh, once this has been done, then the patient's concerns and questions are, are addressed. And once the biopsy results are available, then we have mentioned about the importance of a multidisciplinary approach in treatment of breast cancer. Then this uh, maps up the a patient's journey in terms of treatment. After all is done and treatment has been done, planning a uh, follow-up of the patient is very key um, because again, the initial um, years after treatment is key in terms of um, following up for um, recurrence. I will mention about the signs and symptoms of breast cancer, which are um, the things that as clinicians, we will be looking for when you are doing clinical breast examination. I pulled up this um, uh, from uh, uh, a forum we call, which calls itself, itself um, Know Your Lemons. And Know Your Lemons, they used lemons to show what we are looking for. So when you are palpating, you are feeling for any areas which are thicker or different in consistency from the rest of the breast or, a, or a, a hard lump which can be felt. You're also looking for an area which looks different like this, it's either elevated, it's bumpy, or a prominent vein, or this dimpling of the skin in that area. When we're looking at the nipple and areola complex area, we're looking for either crusting, ulcerations, um, a sunken nipple, um, nipple which is different in shape, either it's looking at different direction, it's pulled to a different direction, or a nipple which is discharging a fluid, could be a clear fluid or bloody fluid. We're also looking at the skin, whether it's a red and warm or it has that orange peel appear appearance that has been mentioned over and over. We are also looking for areas of ulcerations. These are to mention, but, uh, but a few, but they are very key. Uh, once this has been seen, of course, we need to, uh, if we are talking about um, uh, low level of um, healthcare, we need to refer the patient appropriately. I've you know, noticed that I did not mention the breast pain as one of the, um, of the signs and symptoms. Um, in as much as it is one of the commonest reasons why a woman will seek um, review by the clinician or breast surgeon, it is not a common presentation for breast cancer. 
and uh, if it appears, it will most likely come as a late presentation um, accompanied by other signs and symptoms. Um, when it comes to treatment, I mentioned that a multidisciplinary approach offers the best treatment and maps the patient's path of, uh, a patient's path of care. Multidisciplinary approach here means we are involving um, the surgeon, uh, oncologist, pathologist, radiologist, um, breast care nurses. Uh, um, uh, we are also involving um, counselors when, when needed. Uh, we are also talking about uh, palliative care. So once a patient has had a diagnosis of cancer, we need to involve all these teams, discuss and see the best way forward for the patient so that you can individualize care and, and uh, offer the patient the best possible treatment. Um, in terms of the surg surgical uh, approach, um, gone are the days when uh, diagnosis of um, breast cancer meant uh, losing the breasts. Um, so I'll talk about operation to the breasts and operation to the axilla. So when it comes to the breasts, there are two ways. It's either breast conservation surgery or mastectomy. And uh, there are several, again, several options of breast conservation um, surgery where we are talking probably about a simple white local or other um, oncoplastic procedures where if more tissue is um, taken off with a reduced cosmetic outcome, then you have modalities of, of moving tissues to fill that defect and, and offer the best cosmetic um, outcome possible. Then of course, um, in our setup, because uh, we had mentioned that most of the patients, probably 80% or even more present at later stage. So most of the patients that you will see with breast cancer will end up having a mastectomy. But then again, even with a mastectomy as an option, there are also options of having, uh, sparing the skin as well as the nipple as you take off the whole uh, breast tissue out and do either tissue reconstruction or implant-based reconstruction. So those are still options, but the standard uh, mastectomy is also is one of the commonest um, uh, operations that in our setting we will be doing for breast cancer. When it comes to the axilla again, um, there's also a, a trend towards minimizing uh, surgery in that area as much as possible because of the attendant um, complications. So um, there's a, a leaning towards um, what we call sentinel lymph node uh, biopsy where we are taking um, the initial few lymph nodes to assess whether the nodes are involved. And again, if they're involved, we will of course need to um, do the standard axillary node clearance, which is the other operation to the breast. Um, so with surgery, uh, we, we, we will also require chemotherapy for some of the patients and chemotherapy here will be polychemotherapy where combining a couple of um, uh, chemotherapeutic agents as advised by oncologists who are a key uh, members of the multidisciplinary team. Some of the uh, patients will also need radiotherapy and uh, radiotherapy here will be, for those who have had breast conservation surgery, will need radiotherapy to the breasts. Some patients may need um, radiotherapy to the um, above the, the nodal areas if the nodes, more than a specific number of nodes is involved. And some may also need radiotherapy to the chest wall if the, the margins of excision are closer than, um, than uh, the multidisciplinary team is comfortable. We also have endocrine therapy, which is um, part and parcel of treatment of breast cancer for for most of the patients who have um, what we call um, the hormone, the receptors. So these are either um, uh, ER or PR um, receptors, which is a progesterone or um, estrogen receptors. So if the patient has um, a positivity on receptors to those, then um, you uh, we will advise the appropriate um, endocrine treatment and the appropriate um, duration. 
Usually for premenopausal, it will be um, tamoxifen. For postmenopausal, we will um, advise on um, aromatase inhibitors where we have uh, several options. Um, also in terms of um, receptors, if the patient has uh, what uh, um, the HER2 positive cancer, then again, we will give targeted treatment for that kind of cancer, either in a um, uh, adju neoadjuvant uh, setting or adjuvant setting as deemed appropriate. I also mentioned that patient follow-up is very key, especially in the past few years, to more especially to monitor for risk, uh, for risk of recurrence and so that if it's identified early, then early intervention is offered. Um, these are the investigations that I had mentioned, which would be key when we are doing the triple assessment. So I think I will not go back onto this, but I will mention that the fine needle, FNA is a fine needle aspiration where um, a, a 21 gauge needle will be passed on through the skin where the, 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 there's a, a suspicious um, area or lesion and um, small tissues will be obtained and the cytology offered for assessment to the lab. We can also do um, cytology when there's a nipple uh, discharge. So you just do a nipple smear and uh, send that for assessment as well. So the rest of the investigation modalities I had mentioned. Um, because um, this um, webinar, we are targeting um, health workers who are at lower levels of care. Uh, uh, I thought it would be important to highlight the role of this healthcare worker. Of importance is a patient education on breast health, which we have talked about. And here, I think it's important to use every opportunity possible, especially like in the uh, well, probably a well woman um, clinic or uh, even a postnatal clinic, so that women are, especially women are uh, educated about breast health and, uh, you know, informed about what to look for or what to inform their clinician should they identify. Uh, clinical breast examination at the most appropriate um, uh, encounter with the patient as well. Uh, should they be presenting, a 40-year-old lady presenting with probably um, um, abdominal symptoms could also be offered a clinical breast examination and as well advice on the importance of having a mammogram at that age and um, a future follow-up should there be no issue of concern at that setting. Um, identifying the signs and symptoms which we have highlighted earlier and referring these patients appropriately and in a timely manner and again educating them because we have um, a lot of patients who are referred but then we end up uh, missing them or losing them to follow up because um, they, they, they at some point probably they seek other alternative uh, treatment options, uh, probably because they were not um, informed better. Health education is uh, important, especially on uh, the prevention measures, which um, the previous uh, speakers have mentioned, as well as uh, education on, 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 on the right um, way of self-breast examination. So in conclusion, um, screening will lead to early diagnosis and um, better overall outcome in breast cancer. Um, mammography is the most appropriate way of screening, but uh, with other methods being complementary um, or used in special cases as we have, as we have highlighted before. Um, healthcare workers should um, use every available opportunity to educate and evaluate, evaluate patients for breast cancer. And the ones um, a suspicion is made of breast cancer, uh, then appropriate and timely referral is paramount.
Um, that's the end of my presentation, and I will uh, take it back to Dr. Carago. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moki, for a very elaborate uh, presentation, uh, taking us through the, the, the you know the, the clinical aspects of uh, breast cancer as it is, trying to understand the issues around screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And uh, I see from the chat box quite a number of questions that are coming up. So I think we'll go straight uh, into the questions. I know that we don't have too much time, so we'll try and see uh, if, we, uh, if we can address as many of them as possible. Uh, but before I go to the questions, I think I have noted also from the chat box a huge request for from participants to you know for, for the presenters to share their presentations. So I think uh, maybe we will have to uh, have a discussion after the session and see how the presentations can be sent to the participants. I see they have most of them have given uh, uh, their email addresses. So straight into the questions. Um, I think the very first question in the chat box was from Oscar Sawyer. Uh, was it to find out if um, lack of frequent sex can cause a cervical cancer in females and prostate cancer in, in, in uh, men. So Dr. Moki, very really briefly, maybe you can answer that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, that has probably been more of a myth than, than anything uh, because we know the risk uh, factors for cervical cancer. We know about um, the herpes virus. So, and uh, the other, the only issue probably in terms of um, um, sex that we could talk about cervical cancer is, you know, the multiplicity of, uh, of, um, of factors, then that increases the risk of, um, of cervical cancer. For prostate cancer, there's no correlation um, with the frequency of, 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 of sex. I think you would have seen it in a subset of, um, of, the, of the population for us to, to make this conclusion. Thank you, thank you for that uh, answer. Another question from Joyce, uh, wanted to know how can we reduce the cost for purchasing mammogram machines and the cost to the patients? I think uh, Dr. Bohr can take that. As well, another question from Gladwell, uh, wanted to know the rationale for 40 to 70 years eligibility for mammogram. So maybe Dr. Bohr, do you want to answer those two? Thank you, Dr. Karagu. So the first question about the cost of mammogram uh, is uh, how to lower the cost of mammogram and the cost to the patient. I think uh, many, many participants here may be from different counties and actually what is happening currently is that all counties have a, mammogram, a mammography machine at their county referral hospital. These machines were placed uh, there uh, through an MOH uh, a partnership, the MES project. And so that, that is a way whereby uh, having it available at the county referral hospitals cannot really be compared to having it at private hospitals. On the rationale for 40 to 70 years for mammography, I think it is based on um, the there are two things. There's one is uh, the age group most commonly affected by breast cancer. And secondly, the breast density. The breast density reduces as uh, women grow older and mammography may not reveal much, uh, you know, at an earlier age when breasts are quite dense. That is why ultrasound is recommended maybe from around 35 to 40 years, uh, but, uh, uh, mammogram, mammography is recommended now about 40 years when breasts are less dense and uh, uh, the calcifications can be um, can be visualized uh, through mammography. I hope that answers the question adequately. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bord. There's another question from Grace. Wanted, wanted to know uh, about uh, the use of hormonal contraceptives and the risk to development of uh, breast cancer. Maybe Dr. Moki can take that. And as you take that, then uh, there was uh, another question from Moses. 
uh, actually he had an, a number of them. One, one of them is why does alcohol increase the risk of breast cancer? And then uh, he also wanted to understand why nulliparity is a risk factor for breast cancer. And he also made a comment that uh, long exposure to estrogen is not clear. So maybe Dr. Moki, you can talk about the issues of hormonal contraceptives and uh, the issues of alcohol, the issues of nulliparity and breast cancer. So um, the most of the issues that he has he has um, he has asked about are about the duration of exposure of the breast to the hormones of um, reproduction, primarily estrogen. So a patient who has had early um, onset of menses and a late um, menopause has had a longer exposure of the, of, the, of the breast to estrogen. A patient who has, had, has not had um, a child, or a patient who has not breastfed in their lifetime, they are all patients who have had a longer duration of, of um, exposure of the breast to estrogen, um, as well as hormonal replace, replacement therapy, as well as oral contraceptive use. So all, all in totality, we are talking about increased duration, of exposure to um, to estrogen, and indeed this has been um, proven to be um, a risk factor for, for for breast cancer. In terms of um, uh, oral contrast oral contraceptives, um, it's not uh, even about the type of uh, the contraceptive use, but it's more about the um, the time that the especially early, earlier use, like earlier than, um, than 20 years use and the duration of use. So that in itself um, increases the risk and, and the risk has been shown to be increased for, for even up to um, 10 years after cessation of using of, of oral contraceptives. Um, in regards to um, uh, alcohol, there previously there had been um, um, correlation between um, alcohol use and, um, and breast cancer. But um, when other factors were, were, were isolated in, in, in other studies, there was no um, you know, single correlation between only alcohol use and uh, breast cancer. So there has been a, a bit of some controversies. So again, we say where there is controversy is probably better to be safe. So, in, so I'll, 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 I'll probably let him make a judgment for himself on that. I don't know if there's something that yes. I have not answered yet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moki for that uh, answer. Maybe before you go to me, just one uh, comment to make is that um, especially for the nurses on this webinar, there is a code for you to access your CPD points. The code is capital J, H, Y, uh, G, that is capital J, number eight, uh, small y, and capital G. That's the code for accessing your CPD points. Uh, I'm looking at other questions. Uh, one, someone talked about a comment on elastography as a substitute for mammograms. Uh, Dr. Moki, can you say something about that? So um, for elastography, there, there is um, there's ultrasound elastography and there's also, I think there's also MRI elastography. But um, so these are some newer modalities of using the, the typical um, techniques of, um, of uh, tissue imaging. But then it, they can be utilized when you just want to get um, a higher definition or more information. But in terms of, especially in terms of screening, it is not something that um, has been uh, tried and tested. Uh, so in, the question was in terms to, in terms, so as a substitute to, to mammogram, mammogram. No, it, yes. it cannot be used as a, a substitute for mammogram, but can be used as an adjunct to either mammogram or, or an ultrasound. Thank you. Another question maybe that might go to you is, is it advisable to tell a client to stay with a lamp because it is not malignant? No, 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 it's not advisable. So what we have um, said earlier is that um, 
if there is any suspicion that there could be something out of the ordinary, then that needs to be assessed. And the definitive diagnosis is a tissue diagnosis. So this patient needs to have the whole triple assessment. Then once we have a tissue diagnosis and say probably this is a fibroadenoma and it is small, it is not big enough for us to be worried, then, then that at that point, then we can advise the patient to, to stay with it. But then again, the patient needs to have a follow-up uh, plan. Uh, Rosemary wanted to know if uh, uh, tobacco smoking is a risk factor for breast cancer. Like uh, many cancers, like many cancers, uh, cigarette smoking has is a is a risk factor to um, to breast cancer, albeit little. And again, I'll also mention that there have also been other studies which have um, countered um, the um, the increased risk of uh, patients who of those who smoke in relationship to to breast cancer so again i would also say where there are controversies i think it is probably better to stay safe um thank you uh, i think there are another questions around the relationship between obesity and breast cancer um, yes, this I think has been addressed by one of the earlier speakers. I don't know if it was Dr. Bor or, uh, or Ben Bella. Um, so, some uh, estrogen is produced in um, fat tissues. So, the risk factor for obese or overweight people in breast cancer is more so. Uh, in the postmenopausal uh, group, because since um, most estrogen is uh, produced from the ovaries, so the those in the reproductive age group will not necessarily have a higher risk as they are in within that age group. But postmenopausal, um, the either, uh, so those who are obese or overweight will have a sustained increased um, estrogen, which is converted within the fat tissues, so they'll have a higher risk of um, developing. Uh, breast cancer. Uh, maybe we can ha uh, have some questions for Dr. Bor. There's a question on how feasible is it to do uh, mammography annually after 40 years? And then uh, someone also asked about mammograms. Uh, they wanted to know is, mammograph, uh, is, is a mammogram preferred under the age of 40? And uh, another one on, can you do a mammogram when you don't have signs and symptoms? So maybe you can address those today. All right, so the first question is about how feasible oh. it is to do yes, How feasible mammogram. is it to do? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, I think it, it, you know, we have quite a way to go with our health seeking behaviors and, um, you know, our attitudes towards screening. But once we understand uh, the benefit, then I think uh, we can be able to do it. And once we make it routine as part of our everyday work, then it becomes uh, more normal to be screened. So um, I think the barriers that uh, exist may hinder that even then. And we, we are cognizant and must acknowledge those barriers such as, you know, lack of um, insurance and so forth, and even some uh, insurance like the national insurer does not cover mammogram if unless it's diagnostic, you know. Uh, but we need to come to a place where uh, we value screening and preventive uh, care as much as we value treatment. So I think that would be my comment on that. The second question, Dr. Karago was uh, if you can do it uh, under 40 years. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Moki will confirm, but I, I think it um, it is possible to do it uh, below 40 years, especially for the high risk groups. Uh, but I think it is usually complemented as well by ultrasound and MRI. But I will allow Dr. Moki to comment further. It, it, it is yeah, and maybe the last one. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Moki. Yes, yes. yes. So it's possible, especially between 35 and 40. Um, so there, there's a recommendation for that. 
um, especially for those of, of high risk groups and even the national guidelines above uh, 35 recommends a mammogram. And again, this of course is uh, informed from the data that we've seen uh, from um, and who mentioned that we are seeing uh, more and more patients uh, even up to below 35 having um, a breast cancer. Yes, I think the last question was on uh, whether you can do mammogram when you don't have symptoms. I think that's a straightforward one. Yes, you can do because and you, are, you do mammogram for both screening and diagnostic, yes. Thank you. So unfortunately, yes, unfortunately, our time is really uh, coming to an end. I know there are quite a number of questions that we have not been able to address. So uh, I'm seeking uh, maybe the input of Dr. Board, how we can go about this. I know there has been uh, requests around uh, us sending some presentations to the participants. So maybe can we say we can conf um, compile the questions and uh, you know uh, send the, the particular answers as we send the presentations? Would that be a good way forward? I think that would be a good way forward. And uh, this is an indication that we need to have more of such sessions. Yes. Yeah, and perhaps Dr. Karago, you can highlight uh, the session this evening that will be focusing on treatment. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. maybe you can just talk about it. Uh, you might have yeah. more specific details. Yes, yes. Mm. so some, some participants may have attended uh, two webinars in the past, uh, last week which were part of a three-part webinar series on breast cancer. This particular webinar, we try to compress everything into one webinar, uh, but really focusing on the primary healthcare workers working at level two and level three. But if you're interested to hear more about can breast cancer treatment, we have a session this evening. It will be hosted on the Kesho platform. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ojuka, who is a breast surgeon, and Dr. Andrew uh, Odiambo, who who is a medical oncologist will be the facilitators. So perhaps uh, I can put the link in the chat and maybe you can copy it uh, for yourselves quickly. Uh, I don't know how else to provide it for you <laughs> participants. Thank you. All right, thank you. I see, I think Belinda has a burning issue. We don't want her to burn. So let's give her maybe one minute to say, say make a comment, Belinda. Well, I, I thought her, her hand was raised, but uh, she, I don't hear any uh, comments from her side. So I, I think uh, in the interest of time, we will really um, uh, want to bring this to a close and uh, want to really thank all of us for joining in, in this um, uh, webinar and uh, take, um, you know, extend my very uh, special gratitude to the four presenters who have uh, taken us through uh, the four presentations. They have given us very you know, relevant, very up-to-date information around uh, breast cancer. And I believe as uh, participants, we have been able to uh, benefit from uh, you know, uh, some, a wealth of knowledge and uh, I'm, I'm better informed about breast cancer than we were when we were coming in. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, KNH for hosting this webinar. Uh, for providing this platform for us to be able to exchange and share this knowledge. And uh, even for the sponsors who uh, include uh, Kenco and uh, Kemri and uh, Novartis. And uh, as, um, as, as, as you have noticed, as you may have noted uh, through the chats that uh, there was a call for participants to uh, submit their details so that they can get some um, uh, reimbursement for airtime. I meant to understand that uh, it's a, uh, you get a, a reimbursement of about 350 shillings for your airtime. And that should come through within the next seven days. So we want to thank you for uh, your participation. And uh, we, we, we encourage, uh, we are encouraged by the demand of, for information that is, uh, you know, that's coming through from this, from the chat box, from the questions. And I think we look, moving forward, we'll uh, 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 we know, we'll, uh, we will uh, try and uh, have uh, more of these forums uh, so that we can share knowledge and, you know, 
be more informed as healthcare workers. So I want to thank all of us for our participation. Uh, I I think somebody wants to know before I before we close off. Somebody wants us to confirm the the CPD uh, code uh, is a capital J, then number eight, small y, and then G. This is a the CPD code for nurses. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank all of you for your participation. Allow me to thank our presenters for very uh, elaborate uh, presentations and uh, wish all of us a good afternoon and let us continue providing the best care that we can to manage breast cancer. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Karam. And have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you and bye.